Hello and welcome to Digging for Gold, How to Study the Bible for Yourself. We are so happy to have you with us as we're going to consider now application. What is the text telling us to do? And how can we put into practice the truths of God's word? Well, this class is for May 27th, but we're thankful to have one more week coming up after this one. And that will be Wednesday, June the 3rd. We'll have the opportunity to take your questions. If you will put a comment as you're watching this, notice a scripture that you'd like us to talk about or a question regarding observation or interpretation or application, something you want us to take a little more time to discuss or go over again, that'll be our top priority for the June 3rd class. Please let me know what you'd like us to look at. And depending on the nature of the responses, we may do a spin-off class on your Bible questions and spend more time with each one that you would like for us to uh, dig a little deeper on. Then we'll take the opportunity to review this entire series and also to summarize the class as we bring it to a close. But we're at that point now where we're really focusing on taking what God has given us and applying it, putting it to work, exercising it in our lives. I saw a graphic with this billboard. I thought, yeah, that's the way life is. Wonder if you are like me, you have some unfinished projects, some things that you may be going after right now during the break with this virus. And many of us have more time at home. Maybe there's an attic or a garage or Something I know now I've gone to meddling, talking about your stuff and what you might have and where, but uh, unfinished projects. And what about a billboard that uh, has this title, but they didn't even complete the billboard? Then I smile even more when I see what's on the rest of the billboard. Are you ready? That's right. It's from one of the great home improvement stores. Let's build something together. Well, we got to start with ourselves, don't we? before we can go on to others. The Bible talks about that. You know, it's one thing to have paint in the can, even to know where it is, that's another step of what color it is and the finish. But then we might also say, well, I've got the roller, I've got the brush, I've got the extension pole, but to take all of that out and actually get down to work, that's application. And that's what we're talking about now. Someone said the past is where you learned the lesson. The future is where you apply the lesson. Don't give up in the middle. You know, knowing what the Bible says is only half the battle. Taking action based on it is the other half. I heard one man who was asked, are you troubled by the parts of the Bible that you don't understand? And everybody expected him to say, yes, of course I am. I want to keep studying and learning and growing. But instead he said, well, I'm troubled by the parts of the Bible that I do understand. And what he meant by that was the scriptures are so clear regarding so much of what we are to do and not do in our lives. We want to figure out everything that we possibly can. But there's a time to get in the book and research, and peruse, and explore. There's a time to think about what is this verse or this passage saying? What does it mean? What's its significance? But what's the value of all that if we let it go there and don't move on? Remember, we note in the book of James, be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. You don't want to look in a mirror and see what needs to be corrected in your appearance, and then walk away and forget what you've seen. That's the analogy that James uses. Jesus said, John 13, the night before he died, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. There's so much to be said for action. And then in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? We hear this phrase, don't talk the talk, walk the walk, or walk the talk. We say we have to practice what we preach. 
we must uh, do what we profess and live out the principles and the values and the message that God has given us. So when you have your Bible, you want to have presided a to-do list. And I like to add a to-be list because the Bible starts with what we are to become in Christ. And then the outward part flows from that. I saw this also where you can buy a mug. Here's one side and the other side. Here's a good to-do list. Spend time with Jesus, Psalm 27, 8. Let him prioritize my day, Matthew 6, 33. Pray instead of worrying, Philippians 4, 6. Be honest about my sins, James 4, 10. Think of others first, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Wait patiently for God to act, Psalm 27, 14. Be willing to do hard stuff, Matthew 16, 24. Read God's word, Psalm 119, 9 through 16. Do what it says. We mentioned James 1, 22, and let Christ lead me. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. There's the passage where the Lord says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Are you weak? Are you burdened? Are you struggling? Jesus will get in the yoke with you or take you into his yoke. And the two of you pulling together in the same direction. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You shall find rest for your souls because I am meek and lowly in heart. When it comes to application, if we were just to take this list of 10 things, we would have our plate full. Oh, mentioning that, I meant to say, first thing you want to do when you get this mug is fill it with coffee. As you're drinking your coffee, <laughs> read the side of it. And once again, there's so much here to, to chew on and to be about. Unlocking the Scriptures is a book I mentioned that you might want to pursue. It's written by Hans or Hans Fenzel, and it also talks about this inductive method as we've considered during this course. But in the section on application, he says, you want to ask yourself when you read a passage of the Scripture and you interpret it so that you can understand it, uh, what does it tell me regarding God? Is there a truth that I should rest in? And I've added a couple of these. I want to say there may be a trait of God, a quality that I am to revere or honor, that God is holy or God is righteous or God is unchanging, cannot lie, and so forth. Or is there a gift for which I'm to thank God, a reason that I should worship God, a quality of his that I must imitate, a command to obey, a prayer to express, a challenge to heed, a promise to trust, a fellowship to enjoy. And I noticed with each of these, and I almost, under, I almost underlined the, the action, rest in, revere, thank, worship, imitate, obey express, heed, trust, enjoy. Application is about what we're going to do because of what we've in, observed and the meaning that we have understood from each text. So application, just like everything in the Bible, starts with God, knowing who he is and therefore what I am to be and to do. Fenzel goes on to talk about application regarding yourself. Maybe you're to examine a thought or word, take an action, follow an example, avoid an error, change an attitude or guard against a bad way of thinking, a change a priority, strive for a goal, hold up a personal value or standard, forsake a sin. So as you're observing and you're interpreting, you're keeping your to-be list and your to-do list and you're noting how your mind is going to change. For example, Romans 12, 
1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So Romans 12 is telling me what to do to present my body to God as if I am the sacrifice placed on the altar, living, complete, given to him, and that that involves renewing the mind. So the Bible is going to tell me what to think, um, how to proceed, the perception of life I am to have. And first, it starts with my relationship to God. I'm going to be a, a devoted sacrifice to God. And then, regarding myself, well, this uh, doesn't fit. Maybe it's jealousy or it's anger or it's lust, selfishness or pride or dishonesty, laziness. And, and I'm thinking about something in my life where I need to apply the paint. <laughs> I need to take out the tool. I need to put it where it belongs and with God's help, make that change. And once again, we're saying if we reach all the way up to application and then we don't go into application, what have we gained? If we just look at the paint can, but we leave it there, or if we look in the mirror, but then we turn away and we don't make any alteration based on what we've seen. I also want to remind us that really once we've come to interpretation as we have, the application is already built in there. For example, we talked about Noah. and We said, well, I'm not to go and build a boat and put my family in it. I interpret that what I'm to do is to save my family, be a preacher of righteousness, an example of godliness to the world, and inherit the righteousness that comes by faith. So once I've interpreted, this is what Noah did, and this is the meaning for me, then right then and there, I know what I am to do. So then I can get busy with my to be and my to do list. Well, then Fenzel goes on to talk about application to others. Maybe I'm going to see in the Bible uh, a message that I am to share in my home or with brothers and sisters in Christ or at work or in school or society or the world. There's something here for me to do with outsiders, with those that are not New Testament Christians, the Bible describes, not part of the Lord's church. So uh, here's an encouragement I can extend to someone. Notice again the action. Share, extend, perform, ask, forgiveness, nurture, fellowship, give, exhortation, bear a burden, express a kindness, extend a form of hospitality. Once again, the attitude I can change or guard against or adopt if it's a good attitude with other people. And there's uh, the renunciation of sin. I might take a passage like Romans 12, and it instructs me specifically what to do. It tells me to, uh, if my enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If possible, so much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Don't be high in your self-estimation, but condescend to the lowly. Uh, let love be without hypocrisy, Romans 12, 9. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Weep with those that weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice. So sometimes the Bible tells me I don't have to figure it out. The challenge is not in grasping it. It's in accomplishing it. It's not hard to understand I'm supposed to feed my enemy. I get that, but it's the doing of it. And that's what is so very, very important. I wanna to say too, lest we forget, 
that exercising what we've taken in from the Word of God enlarges our appetite for more. My wife and I had friends in Philadelphia when we lived there some years ago, and the man did quite a bit of running. He'd get up every day and he'd run and he'd run and he'd run. His name was Rod. I said, Rod, why do you run every day? He said, because it allows me to eat more. Well, that's pretty good motivation. By burning off the calories he'd taken in, those endorphins started running and he could enjoy another meal. Well, the same is true, I'm convinced, in our relationship to Christ. If I read a passage like Romans 12 and I understand it, but I don't do anything about it, I sit on the couch like a couch potato, I'm going to get lazy and complacent. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to do less. I will lose my energy, my enthusiasm, my zeal, my fire. I won't be all pumped up about serving God. Why? Because I took in these calories from the scriptures and I didn't work them out. So I'm bloated. I, I've taken in a lot, but I'm not uh, exerting myself so that I could take in more. So application, very, very important. It keeps this process healthy. It keeps you fit and trim and, and healthy uh, in your walk with God. So it may be I'm gonna see an application that I need to make toward others. Maybe my spouse. I like to say that everything the Bible teaches practically about getting along with other people starts at home, in your marriage, and in your family. Well, think about Satan. And what is the Bible telling me? Well, he's like a roaring lion, ravenous, looking for someone to devour. He's a snake in the grass. He's a dragon. He's the adversary. He's the accuser. He's determined for me to be lost in hell. So shouldn't I be as energetic as I can be to, to defeat him <laughs> and not allow him to do that? So Ephesians 4 says, don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil a place or a foothold or uh, an opportunity, an occasion to, to get you. So there's one very clear application. I'm to deal with my anger because Satan could use my anger to get a hold of me and I might be lost one day. So what's the weakness that I'm to acknowledge? Is it lust, fear? Is it doubt? Is it complacency? Uh, and so how would the devil use that against me? When I realize what he wants to do, I know what I need to do. Uh, what about the spiritual armor, the helmet of salvation, Ephesians 6, the uh, uh, belt of truth, the uh, uh, shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the uh, sword of the spirit, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace? Is there uh, something there that I'm not wearing right now? And so the devil's going to get in there. I'm not building my faith. I'm not carrying the sword of the spirit which is the word of God, which is what this class is all about. I'm not focusing on prayer, that passage goes on uh, to say. And so maybe uh, I notice, and I added this to Finzel's list, maybe I see in the Bible an example from which I can learn someone that lost to Satan. Maybe it's um, uh, Cain with Abel, or maybe it's Eve and Adam, or maybe I see how Job would not give in even when Satan behind the scenes was attacking him and trying to pull him away from God. And that's another thing I learned in the Bible is that Satan attacks us because that's the only way he can try to hurt God. He can't damage God or injure God or kill God but just as the book of Job shows, if he, can, if he can hurt God, so to speak, if I may use that term, if he can attack God by taking out a faithful servant. That's what he wants to do. So I may learn from Job's example 
how to respond when I suffer a, a physical ailment or I lose something or someone precious to me. Well, I'm going to resist temptation. I'm going to avoid the devil's trap, which uh, among other things involves ego. The Bible warns about that in 1 Timothy 3, that if a new convert is named as an overseer or an elder or a shepherd, he may become conceited and fall into the devil's trap. Or 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and many going after it have been ensnared. ensnared. So uh, uh, there's a uh, person perhaps in your life that you need to resist. Get away from them. Walk away. Uh, don't let them pull you from Christ. Someone said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's been noted that you will become like the five people with whom you spend the most time. Satan wants you to be under the influence of those that are worldly and secular, those that are half-hearted, that are not sold out for Christ. Certainly, we want to influence every person we can, but we will not allow a, a person that's weak in the faith or has no faith to deter or distract us. Well, there may be a sin in your life or mine that if we're not committing it, we must avoid it. Satan wants us to consider it and do it, or if we have practiced it, we'll confess it and we'll repent of it and we will turn our hearts toward God. So I like Hans Fenzel's book, Unlocking the Scriptures. Just like with other references I've mentioned to you, I'm not endorsing everything that he says or his understanding or interpretation of every scripture. But this idea of making application, what do I need to do toward God? What do I need to do toward myself? What do I need to do toward others? What do I need to do toward Satan? You know, the Bible goes on to say that if you resist Satan, resist the devil, he will flee from you. So we're told, once again, what we are to do. Well, I want us to open the Bible now to Matthew, where we find in chapters 5 through 7, that amazing sermon on the mount. We introduced this last time because Jesus closes with this application. He doesn't just tell his listeners the facts and the truth and the interpretation. He does that. There's a lot of observation and interpretation in this powerful presentation, Matthew 5 through 7. But he wraps it up by saying, in effect, what are you going to do as a result of it? Are you going to listen and take out the tools, get the paint out of the can, and, and start building on these teachings? Or are you going to ignore them and place your house on sand, and then when the storm and the wind, when the dangerous uh, problems come, your house will stand or fall, depending not on observation, depending not on interpretation, but depending on, that's right, application. What did we do with what we observed and interpreted? And so Jesus used that image, and you and I see it. We wonder sometimes why people build in a spot that's likely to have an earthquake or a flood, uh, some terrible disaster that's going to take their home down. And certainly, we regret the loss of any home or other property, and I'm not suggesting that people can know in advance always where it's safe to build and where it's not. But I do know that Jesus' principle is so clear regarding our spiritual construction. So what if we were to take the Sermon on the Mount, and in each of the topics that Jesus addresses, we were to ask ourselves, how would we use that to build something solid and permanent and effective? Or how would we ignore that and build on something that's not rock 
so that eventually it's going to be demolished because underneath it is simply sand. So open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 5, and all we can do is to summarize and notice some of the key ideas here. Sometime back in the Keller Church of Christ, I presented a series on the Sermon on the Mount that I called Keys to the Kingdom. If you would like to watch those on YouTube or see the notes from them on the blog post, please get in touch, and of course, we'll be happy to share them. But Jesus starts out, as you know, with the B attitudes. One writer called them the B attitudes because he's telling us to be poor in spirit, to be those who mourn, to be meek, uh, to be those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers, to be willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. And we've always said, I want to say again, Jesus starts with what we are to be, and then what we are to do, he will explain, but that's the natural outgrowth, and we will appreciate it and not resent it. So notice, if I'm going to build on rock, then on my list in my journal, I'm going to write down specific ways that I can humble myself, develop a greater appetite for the things of God, pursue peace with people that are at odds with each other or perhaps with myself. I'm going to list the sins of myself over which I should uh, mourn and perhaps the sins of the world and the culture, the nation, uh, and mourn over theirs. I'm going to find someone toward whom I can be merciful, and uh, I'm going to try to be pure in heart. I'll, I'll note the things that defile my, my, my spirit, you see. So now, if I do those things, I'm building on rock. If I'm building on sand, I'm going to ignore this and continue to be egotistical, harsh, rude, mean, self-seeking. I'm going to seek to be popular and avoid persecution at all costs. I'm never going to mourn. I'm never going to be hungry for the things of God. And so I, I may have a nice looking house, but it's built on sand and it will not last. So what if we take each one of the keys to the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount and we observe them, now we interpret them, and so we're going to apply them. You're the salt. You're the light. And so influence. How can I uh, uh, flavor? How can I preserve? How can I impact the people in my life and those with whom I work and the neighborhood in which I live? How can I set the light uh, for all to see, not for my own glory, but so that others might praise the God of heaven, who is my Father, and I'm going to have a to-do list. Now, if I'm building on sand, I'm going to keep the salt in the shaker. I'm going to put the light under a bushel or a bed. So Jesus is actually telling us here how to build on rock and how to build on sand. You want to build on rock? Put the light up here. You want to build on sand? Put the light where no one can, uh, can see it or benefit from it. And then I group a couple of these together, self-control, where Jesus talks about uh, do not murder, do not let anger get hold of you. Uh, he starts in verse 17, talking about this inside-out righteousness, which is not merely a matter of externals. And then down to verse 27, don't commit adultery, don't lust after someone that is not your mate. So here, pretty clear, I can build on rock by uh, restraining anger, confessing it, letting it go, refusing to re retaliate, refusing to insult people and curse them and so forth. Uh, I can build on rock by making things right by those that I have offended, even before I go to worship. I can... Uh, 
uh, deny lust by refusing to look at certain things, pornography, some kinds of entertainment, uh, even, even commercials and events that are broadcast on television. And during uh, part of those presentations, there are things that, that are intended to arouse the wrong kinds of desires. So you can do exactly what I'm doing. I'm just giving you an example how you would make application. Faithfulness, for example, chapter 5, 31 is about marriage. And then starting at 33, about uh, oaths. Your yes is yes and your no is no. Do what you say. Say what you mean and follow through. And regarding marriage, if you promise to God that you would be a faithful husband to this woman until one of you dies, uh, just do it. And, and, uh, and don't look for some excuse uh, to, to get out of the commitment you've made to God and to your mate. And uh, recognize the exception Jesus gave in verse 32 about sexual immorality. But uh, other than that, he says, stay married. Uh, you told God that you would. You told your mate you would. And be faithful. Be uh, devoted to your marriage. And you and I would say, Make your marriage the happiest, the best, the most wonderful, pleasant experience for both of you that it can ever be. And then turning the other cheek, going the extra mile. Jesus teaches that whatever someone else does to me does not determine what I do in response. If someone hits me, I may have this urge to hit back, but I don't have to do that. I can choose not to retaliate. Someone wants my coat, I can say, hey, take my shirt. Uh, if someone makes me do something, I can do it and say, let, let me do twice as much. Go the second mile. I have the ability to respond. And so here I have a lot of application for myself. Uh, uh, the things that other people might do to you or me and the desire we have to do this or do this or this we're not going to do that we're going to respond instead as christ did and of course love not just for those that uh, love us first or greet us or help us or reciprocate but uh, the kind of love that god has he sends the sunshine and the rain on the evil and the good the just and the unjust. I want to imitate God. I want to prove that I am my father's child by acting like my father toward people that don't like me, people that mistreat me, people that write me off or snub me. I'm not going to uh, be, be directed by what they've done or even by what I want them to do but by who God is and what he's done for me. So I'm simply taking these things and making application. Now, the next three we need to consider together, generosity and prayer and fasting, because they're all part of the same thing. In chapter six, Jesus says, don't do what you do for show, uh, for it to be seen by other people. In your giving, don't sound the trumpet. In your praying, don't go out and wear fancy clothes and impress people with your eloquence and the length of your prayer. And when you fast, don't make it look like you're going without food or drink. And so in each of these, Jesus is telling how we are to do these things, our giving, our praying, and our fasting. But here is also application. Give, pray, fast and and do it god's way but the application is already there investment you know if you put everything you have here on earth somebody's going to steal it or the precious jewels and metals will rust away or the moth will eat it up put your treasure in heaven and don't try to serve two masters serve god so once again the observation and interpretation are easy in this case so is the application Application is easy to grasp, not easy to do, because we're so tempted to, to store up just material things that aren't going to last. Well, don't be preoccupied with what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll wear, 
how tall you are, how long you will live, what's going to happen tomorrow. Jesus said, you have a father in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. God will take care of you. Look at the birds. Look at the grass, the lilies of the field, how they grow. Won't God uh, provide for you even more so? So verse 34, don't be preoccupied with tomorrow. Uh, you'll miss today. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then chapter seven, you know, warns us against a judgmental attitude toward others. Don't be nitpicky. Don't be trying to get the speck of sawdust from your brother's eye. When, when I may, you or I may have a plank in our own, deal with yourself first. Then you can help this other person. Don't give what is holy. Uh, don't throw away what's valuable uh, on dogs or pigs. So there has to be a discernment as to what you do with what God has given you, but don't have a critical attitude. And then direction, these two roads. There's a broad road that leads to destruction, to hell. There's a narrow, tight one that leads to life. Only a few find it. And so Jesus talks about not only two roads and two gates, but he talks about sheep and wolves, uh, talkers and doers. He says that the day of judgment, many will say, and they'll, they'll say the right thing, but he will tell them, you are evil doers uh, who might claim to do things for the Lord, but he said you are evil doers. So obedience. And then, of course, where we started, the application to the whole thing is a call to action, to take what Jesus has said and actually put it into practice and uh, implement his teachings. So what we've tried to do in this session on application is to emphasize the fact that the Bible is a manual for living. Yes, it's filled with facts and truths and heavenly realities, the attributes of God, the creation of the world. There's so much here that calls for deep thought, for reflection, for consideration, for observation. Not taking away from that, we need to make the point again and again and again that the Bible is God's manual for everyday living. Sometimes you have to do a little digging for gold to uncover the principle that you are then to apply. At other times, in fact, quite often, the application is right on the surface because God will tell us exactly what he calls us to do, invites us to do, and expects us to do or not those things that are prohibited. And we've tried to say that observation and interpretation are valuable in and of themselves, but also as they lead to and produce a change in attitude, a change in speech, in direction, in behavior, in relationships, a change in our faith and our hope and our love. Next week, June the 3rd, will be our final session in this class. And then we'd like to have your questions. Is there a scripture you'd like some assistance in understanding or applying? Is there a, a, a theme in the Bible that you think we really should point out before we wrap things up? Is there a truth? Is there a key? Is there a priority in your own digging for gold? Because remember, this is an inductive Bible study. This is not something primarily in which I want to be here telling you uh, what I have uncovered and what I've come to realize from the Bible. In a sense, this class has to be like this because it's not interactive in person like we uh, would like for it to be. But because it is inductive, I'm inviting you now, as soon as you finish watching this, to go ahead and take out your paper and write down and then contact me with a scripture, a question, a theme, or an idea that you'd like us to address in our last meeting together 
uh, on June the 3rd. And then we'll use whatever time we have left to do some more application, especially in 1 Peter chapter 5, and then to summarize and review this entire series together. Thank you again. I hope you'll be with us next time. Bye-bye for now.